Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, good morning to our online students as well. Hope my voice is audible. Give me a thumbs up if it is. If the voice is audible, uh, it's probably okay. All right, so last week uh, we did only one hour of class, so we looked at uh, uh, the, a couple of portions of uh, chapter nine, the shadows of the cross. Uh, yeah. So we looked at the shadows of the cross, and um, this week we go to chapter ten. We look at the cross in prophecy, right? Uh, now, as we always say, the cross is not something that God decided all of a sudden. Right, the cross was there from the beginning, before the foundations of the world. The cross was already prepared, right? And when God wanted to do something, He always spoke to His prophets, right? Uh, and see, so we look at all through the Old Testament, we see that it's not only about the cross, but uh, you know, God is speaking to the prophets and talking about what Israel will be as a nation. What will happen to that nation? So we look look at it all the way from Abraham itself, right? So now let's look at the cross in prophecy, right? Uh, let's look at a few portions here. In Psalms two, uh, it talks about you know I will give you the nations for your inheritance, uh, and so in the book of Psalms there are many prophecies about Jesus, right? About the cross, especially. Uh, and let's read this. Uh, I know it's a long, uh, not very long, but let's read Psalms 2. Uh, maybe one of us can read Psalms 2. Whole chapter? Yeah, the entire, uh, the entire chapter of Psalms 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples uh, plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers bent together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their chains and throw off their sickles. The one enthroned in heaven, love the Lord, scoffs at them. He rebukes them in, high, in his anger and uh, terrifies them in his breath saying, I have installed my king on giant, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your po uh, possession, possessions. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you king, be wise. We want you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling trembling kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction for his way for his breath can flare up in a moment blessed are all who take refuse in him right yeah thank you so if you look at the entire uh, psalms 2 it's pointing towards the one who is anointed the anointed one. Look, look, let's look at a few uh, verses from there, right? Uh, verse 5 says, Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet, verse 6, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Right? Let's look at verse 7. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And if you look at prophecy to the cross, after, after what Jesus did for us, we become sons and daughters of the Lord Jesus, right? Ask of me, this is a very famous uh, verse that we always use, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them, what is it? sorry, you shall break them with a rod of iron. So all of this is talking about the anointed one, 
the Lord Jesus, right? And what he did. Uh, let's look at verse uh, 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are those who put their trust in him. So when you look at the book of uh, uh, the entirety of Psalms 2, we see that we're talking about this anointed man of God, the anointed king, right? Let's look at the next one. They divide my garments. Psalms 22, 16 through 18. It's there on your notes. So maybe one of us can read that. Psalms 22, 16 through 18. It's on your notes. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They praised my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Yeah. So what a pinpoint prophecy of the cross, right? Now, this is written hundreds of years before, right? What does it say there? Dogs are surrounding me. The congregation of the wicked have enclosed me. What happened on the cross, right? The wicked people who, you know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Romans, they were all there, right? And what did they do? They pierced my hands and my feet. Now, David is writing under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And David is writing about the cross. And it's so accurate, right? They pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. I think last class we talked about the crucifixion. No? Uh, the word crucifixion uh, is, is it, uh, excruciating. It comes from that word excruciating. What is excruciating? A pain that is cannot be borne, right? excruciating pain. And when you look at the cross, uh, you know, I, 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 I shared last week how the Lord Jesus took up extra right? because it was usually during crucifixion, they would just take the person, crucify him. And that's why the death would take longer time. Right? But Jesus was scourged and beaten. Uh, and we know the Roman, uh, you know, lashes of 37, my, uh, 37 lashes. And that would have been so painful. And the point was, you know, Pilate wanted to say, okay, let, let him go, just leave him. But they said, no, crucify him. So half his body was already beaten up. And then the cross happened, right? And that's where this thing, I can count all my bones. They look and they stare at me. Verse 18, they divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Accurate? Very, very accurate, right? Let's look at the next one. Not one of his bones is broken. Psalms 34, 20. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Again, it was uh, a prophecy uh, which was fulfilled. So what does it teach us when we read all this? God is not just giving us an overall prophecy. right? Okay, the cross is going to happen. Right? One day, my, I'll send my son and he will die on the cross. It's not an overall prophecy, right? God is speaking to these prophets and giving point by point a revelation of what is going to happen. If you look at, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the other books, uh, I think in Isaiah it says, when he comes, he will, he will be like a, a, a man with, with no, you know, there will be no greatness in him. His, his looks, there will be nothing to say, oh, you are Jesus. It's not like we're going to say, oh, Jesus, you look so wonderful. You look so beautiful. No, right? there was nothing beautiful about him. Right? There was nothing like to look at him in his appearance. There was nothing like, oh, very great Jesus. You look very smart. Nothing. He was just a regular person who was walking around. But he was the son of God. Right? The book of Isaiah says uh, he will eat curds. Right? Uh, forget the portion there. Uh, He'll eat curds. He will walk with people, right? point to point. Right? And uh, some of the prophecies say he will be born in uh, Bethlehem. Now, how did this prophet know hundreds of years before that these two will go to Bethlehem? So you see, God, he knows the entire picture. 
right? And you, when you look at it, you look at all these prophecies, he knows the entire picture, even before the picture's been painted. Right? Not one of his bones will be broken. Next one, fierce witnesses. Psalms 35, 11. Fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I do not know. And that happened in the book of Mark uh, 14, 57, and 58, where they asked him, tell us, who, who are you? Are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? Are you the one we are going to be waiting for? And Jesus says, hey, I've been telling you all this while I am the Messiah. Right? And fierce witnesses rised up against him. My own familiar friend, Psalms 41 and verse 9, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And who is this talking about? Judas? Yeah. Right, so Luke 22, 47 to 48. Even my own familiar friend whom I, in whom I have trusted, who I ate bread with, has lifted his heel against me. Now, who's writing this? Psalms. <laughs> yeah, so David is writing this under the anointing. He's writing it about Jesus and what will happen later on. Right? Shame and spitting. Isaiah 15 verse 6, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Right? Again, Isaiah is writing about what, what is going to happen to Jesus. I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked his beard. Did they do that? Yes. Right? They beat him. They scourged him. They plucked his beard, they spat on his face. They said, oh, look, the king is here, the king of the Jews. They mocked him, they ridiculed him. But all of this was spoken of earlier. Wounded in my friend's house, Zechariah 13 and verse 6. And one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Right? Last one, me whom they have pierced. Now this we know, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look upon me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. They will look upon him whom they have pierced. Right. So all of these wonderful prophecies, and there are many, many, many more prophecies uh, which, we, which we'll go to the next chapter and see. But can you picture the Lord Jesus right, in his ministry? He's opened up the book of Isaiah right, and he's reading all this. So, man. This is me one day, right? Remember, uh, he uh, in his first uh, public appearance uh, as a as an adult when he started his ministry. What did he do? He went. He found the book of Isaiah and he read from there, right? So he would have also read all of this. So he knew what's ahead of him, right? He knew. He knew that all of this is going to happen to him, and he took it up with gladness. Right, so let's go to the next chapter, Isaiah 53, talking about the cross described. Right, any questions on this? I'm sure we all, you know, uh, have learned about this uh, in terms of, you know, re even in the Old Testament, uh, we've seen and read all of this. So, uh, but any questions? Any questions from our online students? Yeah, yeah. Mm. No, so so the 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 point he's trying to say is they asked me things that you know uh, which were not not in line with what was happening there. So for example, they asked him, uh, tell us are you the king of the Jews? 
he knew it but it was not like so remember like prophecies are are something that the psalmist is putting his place in that position right he's putting himself there he's writing under the anointing but he's putting himself there right so it's a it's it's a prophecy that is going to happen but he's trying to put himself in that situation so even if you look at the previous ones this was most of the prophecies are when david was running away right so fierce witnesses will rise up they ask me things that i don't know meaning it was more of um, you know uh, asking him about it, not not related to jesus in the terms of you know um, uh, you know asking questions you know what is going to happen in the cross what is you know this is what is going to happen to you no he knew everything right all through the uh, his ministry he said you know one day i'm going to go to the cross uh, but the point is those fierce witnesses right uh, the the other portion of they ask me things that i do not know uh, can be you know things that they probably asked him during his uh, you know during his whole time of persecution and there are times when jesus did not answer right he chose to answer does he know everything yes but he chose not to answer and he just walked away in some places so the point is the fierce witnesses who rose up against him right knowing that now when we we know that the lord jesus when he walked he walked in under the anointing of the holy spirit uh, there were things that you know he was not omnipresent he, right he walked in sonship glory but he knew according to scriptures he knew what was going to happen to him right and these fierce witnesses probably he's reading it and he's saying oh man one day all these fierce witnesses now he never would have thought the pharisees probably he never thought will the pharisees and sadducees come against him in such a strong way right the romans didn't want to kill him romans were what they were there they were um, the Jews, the Israelites were under the Roman rule. If imagine Pilate is saying, let him go. If the Pharisees and Sadducees, okay, let him go, but he should not be here, then they would let him go. Right? They would let Jesus go. But it was not God's plan. The plan was these fierce witnesses will rise, they will rise against him, they will mock him, spirit him, they will cause him to go into this whole place of uh, you know uh, persecution. So yeah, so it's more about the fierce witnesses that rise up against him. Right, any questions from our online students? Um, okay. All right. Now, let's go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah is, uh, is one of the most powerful books when we read it. How many of you have read the entire book of Isaiah? You have? Right? Uh, it's it's quite confusing, no? Because sometimes you're reading, it's like, oh, it's going all over the place. Uh, you know, one prophet, he's saying something here, then he's saying something here. Uh, it's full of emotions in that book. So I will destroy you. I will take you out of this nation. And suddenly he's saying, I will come, I'm there with you. I will comfort you when you, you know, when you fall down, I will lift you. It's too much of emotions. Now, the book of Isaiah is called a mini Bible. Why? Because it's got everything in it. There is God's love. There is judgment. There is persecution. There is healing. There is everything in that. Right? So chapter 1 to chapter 39 deal with the law and judgment. Right? Uh, that's where we see chapter 1 to chapter 39. It's, and even in between these chapters, chapter 1 and 39, every now and then you'll find these prophecies popping up, right? Uh, but it deals with law and judgment. Chapter 40 to 66 deal with comfort, salvation, and future glory. Now, the book of Isaiah written 750 BC, so about 750 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah is writing, right? So, Isaiah, the prophet, served under four Jewish kings and had a ministry that lasted about 50 to 70 years. He was a married man. Uh, oh, oh, his wife was a prophetess, and they had two children. But now let's look at the authenticity uh, of the book of Isaiah. Right? Uh, yesterday we were talking about you know, the Bible. Uh, is it authentic? Right? Uh, is it something that we can believe? 
uh, is it written by some other people, whatever they feel like? Is it but let's look at the authenticity of this book, right? Malachi was the last book of the Old Testament, 400 BC. And the oldest available copies of the uh, of the Old Testament, I'm sure you're learning all of this in uh, OT, uh, but let's just quickly look at this. The oldest copies of the Old Testament books were about 980, which is 1,300 years from the completion of the last book of OT. So 1,300 years later. Then came the Dead Sea Scrolls. How many of you have read about the Dead Sea Scrolls? Read about it? You must read about it. In 1947, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls was found. Almost the entire Old Testament was found. Right? The writings of the Old Testament was found. And they were all rolled up. Um, and there was uh, papyrus and all these you know, materials were used to protect them. And almost the entire Bible, apart from Esther, was there in that. Right? Now, in that, the book of Isaiah was the complete book, right? And written in in the same. If you, so, if you take, uh, say, for example, the NKJV, right? You have the NKJV here, an English Bible, English Bible, and you have the Dead Sea Scrolls of Isaiah here. How many years before? Almost seven hundred odd years before, right? Here you have a Bible. Here you have the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, when you compare them, it is on point accurate. So it's not like somebody said, okay, let me fool the Christians and write something, uh, you know, in uh, Hebrew and all that, roll it up in one place and, you know, just hide it in some mountain. No, nobody has time for all that. Right? What was written years ago is even available now. So all that we read in the book of Isaiah is authentic to those who wrote it that time. Now, we know there were scribes during the Old Testament, right? So Isaiah would have written. And then over time, there were scribes, right? Scribes, uh, tell me who was a scribe in the Old Testament. Yeah, tell me a name of a scribe. Come on, you should know this is a quiz. The name of a scribe. Who's a scribe? Okay, Ezra was a scribe, right? Ezra was a scribe. Remember, Nehemiah built the walls. He said, okay, Ezra, you come and read the scriptures to all of us, right? So these scribes were there who would write copies of the Old Testament, right? And so this Dead Sea Scrolls was a copy of the book of Isaiah written way back, hundreds, hundreds of years ago, and now it's thousands of years ago, right? And it's accurate. It's the same thing. Right? Now, uh, here's, here's what I want to say. Now, yeah, thank you, Shivakumar said Ezra. Uh, now, for example, each one of you, right? I, see, I give you all a paper, online students as well. I give you all a paper, and I say, go to your rooms, take half an hour, write what you learned in Bible college in this one year? And what was your experience in one year? Right? You all will write and I'll come back. Now, most of you all will you know, write, you know what, I was enjoyed the uh, worship time. I liked, you know, I liked the supernatural hour. Uh, the sessions were good. And you know, the, this is what happened. This is where our horse. But the essence of everything that you've written would have been the same. But the style in which you have written it will be different. Right? Maybe one of you started off with the supernatural hour, writing about that. Maybe one of you started off with the facility, the, the place. Right? So when you look at the Gospels also, and when you look at uh, translations, of course, they were word to word. But when you look at other translations that we have now, many people say, hey, it's so different. Right? When you look at the New Testament, the, Syn the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew is saying something. Mark is saying something, right? Mark is using the names of people. Luke is going into detail. Why didn't Matthew go into detail? Why didn't John go into detail? See, so people have all these things, questions, right? 
but all of them are writing of the same account. What is the account? Jesus' ministry. Jesus' death. Nobody, Matthew is not saying Jesus was, uh, you know, on the cross and uh, Mark is not saying, uh, you know, Jesus died by drowning in the pool. It's all one, right? But the way it's put across is very different, right? So when you look at this, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the translations we have now, you may take a message translation now, right? And put the Dead Sea Scrolls and you say, hey, it's different. Now we know the message translation, right? It's, it explains the verse, but the essence is the same. The essence, the, the point that is being put across is the same. Right? So these Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, especially the book of Isaiah, uh, it, it's so wonderful, right? There's no other place or there's no other religion where scrolls of such old material have been kept and have been, you know, uh, authenticated even now. You know, when we look at uh, people who uh, uh, are in apologetics, right? Uh, are you learning apologetics this semester? Okay, maybe next semester. So apologetics is to give a defense for the gospel, right? And most of them from other faiths say, one thing we know about the Christians is the scriptures they have, the word, the scriptures they have is very authentic. Now, they may not believe, okay, Jesus is the Lord, Jesus is God, he came into this world. They may not believe it, but one thing is, the, the scriptures that are written is very authentic. Nobody has, it's, it's, it's there, there's proof. And there's also, uh, you know, uh, his historians and people who are in apologetics say, one thing we know, there was a man named Jesus. And he died on the cross. So that will not change. right? So that is history. That is proof that it's there. This, the book of Isaiah, is proof that it existed. It is proof that there was a man named Isaiah. It was proof that the, he was there ruling under Jewish kings, living in Babylon for some time under captivity. That is proof. And what he has written is under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look at three views uh, of this amazing, amazing portion of Isaiah 53. First view is a view that sees what Christ would accomplish on the cross as foretold by Isaiah. So the first view is what Christ accomplished on the cross. What did Isaiah say about the cross? Two is where we as believers see what has been made available for us on the cross. That is also mentioned in Isaiah 53. Third view, where we as believers see the imitation of the cross, that is how we apply the cross in our daily lives as instructed in the New Testament. So we're going to look at these three views all from the book of Isaiah. Right. Let's look at uh, the first one. <clears throat> Everyone uh, with me, you're able to understand what's going on, right? So Isaiah 53 is authentic. It is true. It is the, the Dead Sea Scrolls have proved that they are, you know, so real and uh, true. We're going to look at three ways. One, what did Christ accomplish on the cross? What Isaiah wrote. Two. As believers, what is made available to us? And three, as believers, how we can uh, imitate the cross, how we are to apply the cross in our daily life. Let's read um, Psalms 52 and verse 13. Uh, let's just read that. Psalms 52, verse 13. Go ahead. Is that 53 or 52? Okay, it's 52. Is there on your notes? One of you can read it, please. Yeah, read it, read it. Behold my servant, Isaiah 52, 13. Read. 
Isaiah 52 and verse 13. Isaiah 52 verse 13. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. See, my servant shall deal prudently, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. This is a different version. Now, the Hebrew word for uh, servant is Ebed, and Isaiah is speaking of Ebed Adonai, which is the servant of the Lord. Uh, now, how many of you know what a bond servant is? Uh, and the Apostle Paul uses this word, right? I'm a born servant of Christ. Uh, now, uh, let me just explain it to you. When an when a Israelite has a certain debt, right? And he's not able to repay that debt. So, for example, uh, uh, Prince, I, I, I have a debt that I have to repay to Prince. And I'm not able to repay it. So I go to Prince and I say, Prince, you have two choices. Right? Prince has two choices. He can put me and into prison and say, hey, you until you clear your debt, you're going to be in prison. Or he can say, OK, you can't pay my debt. Now I have this whole field, this whole uh, land, and I need some servants in my house. So you come. For the next 10 years, you have to work for me. You can't say, where is my pay, where is my food, nothing. You have to come and work for me. Why? Because you owe money to me. Right? Now I say, OK, better than being in prison, at least I'll be with, you know, he may give me a shelter to stay and food to eat. And I'll work for him. I may not get money, but I'm clearing his debt. Right? So 10 years, my debt will be cleared. Right? So I go to Prince and say, OK, Prince, I, I'll work for you. And I'll uh, whatever you say, I'll do. So he can say, go to this other country, bring something, and come. He can do anything. He can say anything with, and I have to do it. Why? Because I'm a bond servant right now. Right? I cannot run away. If I run away, he can, you know, again, if he he can catch me, and then this time he can put me into prison. Right? So I I am obligated to everything that he says to me. Why? Because I have something to repay to him. Right? And so that is what a bond servant is. Now, after the 10 years, right, I can go to Prince and say, say 10, 10 years is over. I've done what you have told me to do. Uh, now, can you please release me from my, uh, from this place, from this, uh, what I'm doing, and I want to go. Now, he has to release me. Or if I enjoyed, or I, I, I say, hey, Prince was a very good master. He, even though I, you, you know, I, I was, uh, I had to owe him money, but he treated me well. You know, he he gave me food. He he also looked after me, gave me sick leave. Right, he looked after me. So no, I will continue to, uh, you know, work for Prince. Now I'm not a bond servant. I'm just a servant to him. Right? So there's a difference between a bond servant and a servant. Right? Now, here it says, Behold, my servant, a bed, bond servant, shall deal prudently, and he shall be exalted. Right? Uh, and, and here's the thing. Isaiah foretold the resurrection, ascension, and exaltation of Jesus Christ. And we know this fulfilled in Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 through 11. So maybe one of us can read that. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that jesus christ is the lord to the glory of god the father mm. that every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess that jesus christ is lord for the glory of the 
father. Now, behold, my servant shall deal prudently, means he will walk wisely, and he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Is this prophecy fulfilled? Yes. Yesterday we talked about the whole thing of the end times, right? After Jesus died on the cross, he goes, he, uh, Ephesians 4 happens, and he goes, he takes the keys of death and hell, he goes up to the Father, and what happens? The Father doesn't say, good job. The Father says, okay, now at the name of Jesus, the same Jesus, my son, who died on the cross, who defeated the devil, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. All authority and dominion is given to this because of what Jesus did on the cross. Right? So, in a sense, the father's, it's like the, you know, it's just a picture that I'm saying. Right? It's in a sense, the father saying, okay, Jesus, you take over. Now, you know, you try to understand what I'm saying. So, we know that it's Trinity, they are three in one. But in the essence, God is saying, the Father is saying, I'm so pleased that my son has done this. Right? Remember in the water baptism, when Jesus came out, what did the voice say? Behold, my son in whom I'm well pleased. Now imagine, after the cross, after defeating the enemy, how pleased the Father will be. The Father said, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess. So right now, Jesus is the highest name than any other name. Right? And that is fulfilled here. Next one. His visage was marred. The word visage means appearance. Right? His appearance was marred. Isaiah 24 and verse 14. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. I mean, if you have seen Passion of the Christ, I'm sure you have seen that, right? And you've seen the uh, the you've seen Jesus in that last portion, you know, before he goes to the cross, they, that he his body is fully beaten and bruised. Have you seen that uh, that portion, right? Now, okay, those who haven't seen, maybe you can see it, right? Uh, uh, it's like every portion in his body is beaten. Like every portion. He was punched. His beard was pulled off. He probably had the crown of thorns which went into his skull and that, you know, that would have changed the whole uh, visage on his face. He was slapped. He was hit. He was punched. Now, a punch means not one punch and then he's just smiling. Jesus was like, okay, don't worry. It'll heal. No. Uh, those are hard blows. What happens? You'll have a you'll have one purple eye, right? You'll have swelling. It's, it's not it's, it's not like you know these are sensitive parts. The body, you know, it's okay. The swelling, it, but the face, right? Uh, probably would have his teeth would have broken. We don't know, right? Uh, so he was punched. He was beaten, and it says here they were astonished when they saw him. Imagine they brought Jesus out. And Pilate says, okay, here's Jesus. Let's let him go. He's beaten, bruised. Okay. No, crucify him. And all of them saw him and were astonished at his appearance. Right? It says that his visage was so marred more than a man. History says that these rib bones of Jesus were seen. The back bones, the ribs were all seen. Why? Because there's no blood. There's no muscle left. When the soldier pierced his side, what happened? Water came out. So all the blood is gone. What happens if blood goes? This will stick to the bone. Right? Now I'm not talking about when you cut vegetables, blood, you cut, you know, you cut your finger. That itself you can feel, oh, you can feel that burn. Now, when there's no blood in the body, your muscles will stick to the bones, right? And then what will happen? The bones will cut the skin, and your bone will be seen. Simple, right? You meet with an accident, 
and you probably fell down on your hand or your leg what happens you maybe the blood has been uh, blood has flown uh, come out so much that you can see the bone right but if the good thing about blood is it just keeps uh, you know uh, regrowing again it keeps developing again but for jesus the blood was going and going and going right that when they saw him they could not even recognize his that this is jesus probably he was just one lump just nothing standing there and all of them saying crucify him how did he even carry that cross up that mountain they don't know but he was just so beaten and bruised and they could you know history says that you know that he died of a cardiac arrest right his heart attack it, it was on the cross but all those bones there's no flesh you can't go you know though that time you couldn't go to jesus and uh, you know hold flesh it was all going away the blood was just going out that's why the bible says the blood was shed remember the blood covenant we talked about they have to drain out the blood from the sacrifice from the from the lamb all the blood should be drained out why it's a blood covenant here the lord jesus all the blood was drained out it was not like jesus was in good you know okay they beat him up little said come jesus go on the cross and they just put, no the price was paid right the price the entire wrath of sin and death was put on him so the price was paid it's not like jesus just paid some price no the entire guilt and sin and everything was put on him and just thinking of all this the cross looks like you know it's so much more than just wearing it or putting a tattoo right when when the bible says he paid the price he literally paid the price you know uh, some uh, theologians say that he couldn't see because of the blows his eyes would have sw swollen up right and so what happens when your eyes swell up you know, it just becomes so big that you can't open your eyes right there's no strength right? uh, but in all of that he took it he took it right his massage his visage was marred that even if we were there maybe the disciples have seen him is this jesus hey man we've seen jesus as a young man you know 30 years 31 years old we've been walking together i don't think this is jesus that would have been the reaction of the disciples the visage was marred some other theologians say that flesh was just falling off his body the price was paid entire price the complete price was paid next one he shall sprinkle many nations isaiah 52 and verse 15 so he shall sprinkle many nations kings shall shut their mouths at him for what had not been told them they shall see and what they have not heard they shall consider now the word sprinkle has to do with the sprinkling of blood on the altar that we talked about the blood covenant and it expresses this throwing of the blood on the altar is that uh, in the old testament when the uh, when the high priest would take the blood of the lamb he will pour it so for example this is the altar he would just pour it on the altar for the atonement of sins right like sprinkling blood right and that is what jesus did he 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 sprinkled he he shed his blood uh, so that we can find forgiveness kings leaders rulers heads of nations will stand in amazement at jesus christ they will see hear and understand things they have never known on his influence over many nations kings leaders rulers heads of nations will stand in amazement in front of jesus now it could be now or it could be at the judgment seat right but they will stand in amazement and yesterday we were talking about the whole thing of you know the end times and it says in 
you know, in the book of Revelations, it says, hide me from the one who's seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now, imagine people who are saying, hey, I don't believe in Jesus. And now all of a sudden, they're seeing this man in glory seated on a throne. I say, hide me from, who's this? This is Jesus. I don't know there's a Jesus. Kings, leaders, and rulers will stand in amazement of Jesus. And it's going to happen. Even you and me now, you know, we stand in amazement of what he has done for us, right? No matter how great we become, it's still the cross is such a beautiful place. It's an offensive place, but it's also a place of victory. So now when we look at Jesus, we're amazed with what he is and who he is, what he has done for us. So then again, that's a fulfillment of the prophecy. Right? So we'll take a break, we'll come back, and we'll continue from where we stopped. Right.